We are predicting the lines here on the Our Lads Football Network, the Our Lads Football YouTube channel. I'm Greg DePama along with Las Vegas handicapper Andy Isco of TheLogicalApproach.com. And this is a show where we are going to take a look at the lines that we predicted by ourselves within the last uh, 48 hours. The lines have changed a little bit already. We're going to go over them, let you know what we liked about them, let you know also which ones we were way off about them, and what we think might happen later this week. So we have a lot to cover here, Andy. I know last week we kind of just got the ball rolling. We just wanted to get a feel for what we were going to do. So we've modified uh, the format. Uh, we condensed it. So it's going to be uh, twice as short. And uh, hopefully we're also going to zero in a little bit better on what we want to uh, talk about here and get out there to the viewers who are uh, watching for, I I'm guessing, to educate themselves uh, better so they can uh, make some money on some of these games, uh, not only this week, but every week in the NFL and college football. Before we get started, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, Greg. Uh, looking forward to another weekend of uh, exciting college football and NFL surprising action. And yeah, the uh, uh, the benefits of a show like this are hopefully to say not just who to bet, but possibly even when to bet, depending upon which side you're on. Because if we can accurately forecast line moves, there might be uh, uh, beneficial for someone to... Uh, uh, get in immediately, or if they uh, like uh, the other side and we think it's good, line's going to move that way, uh, that uh, or, or against that way, that they might want to wait a little bit and not make uh, their wager until uh, uh, until closer to game time. The old rules used to be bet favorites early, bet underdogs late, because the public historically had liked to bet favorites. However, that's not necessarily been true uh, in recent years to that extent that it had been, and that's uh, because this betting marketplace is sharper. Underdogs are now are now receiving much more attention earlier in the week than later in the week. So it's important to keep in mind that uh, it's not just who you bet, but when you bet to get the best possible number available at the time when you wait and when you make the wager. Yeah, and uh, matter of fact, and, and I don't really care exactly where we talk about some of these topics that uh, we have on our format. We might as well jump right into what you're talking about, or one of the things you're talking about specifically. Actually. Two, two of the games. Let's talk about the let's, let's talk NFL first. Let's talk about that New Orleans Philadelphia game because uh, I was looking. You know, I don't know when you were looking over the line, uh, but I was looking over it on. Uh, I think it was yeah, it was Monday, so it was before the Eagles game, and the Eagles were two and a half point favorite. But I actually uh, thought that the line itself uh, was. Uh, I think I had them. Um, uh, I think I had the Saints at one and a half. And so and immediately I was like, well, uh, yeah, I guess I'm going to take advantage of that. Um, and again, I hadn't seen the Monday night game yet. Then the Monday night game happens and I felt even that much uh, better about the game. But then again, I looked at the line and it went from two and it went from uh, two and a half Philadelphia to two and a half New Orleans. So if you're someone like me, and there might have been a lot. And again, this is just an example of a game. This happens all the time. If you're someone like me that already had a feeling that they were going to take the Saints, then, I mean, t tell me what was there, was there an indication at all of that this line would have could have moved, or did it just move because the Eagles just didn't win and didn't play as good as Vegas thought they were going to play? Well, actually, uh, the initial line move, well, I'll give you a little bit about my process here. The Westgate over the summer put out advanced lines before any games were played, any regular season games were played. In fact, I think they came out uh, at the start of the preseason for every game for every week. So all 272 games had lines attached that you could actually have bet over the course of the summer. Uh, obviously, week one's lines had been up uh, since the schedule was announced back in May. Most places put lines up that far in advance. And then as we got closer to training camps, uh, the Westgate did their thing that they've done for the last few years. So I took a look. Uh, well, first of all, I made my guess on Sunday night for that game. Before, after the Saints had won, impressively in Dallas, but before the Monday night game was played. And my guess was I would have still made Philadelphia a three-point favorite. It okay. turns out, and I didn't know it at the time because I, I did, deliberately did not look at those week three lines until after I had made my prediction, and that was actually the line that the Westgate had up over the summer. Eagles, uh, no, I'm sorry, I believe that was um, a pick'em game over the summer. I, I seem to recall that uh, 
if I if I recall correctly. Okay. That, are those the same uh, lines that are in uh, uh, Mark's playbook magazine? Uh, that I don't know. I don't have it in front of me, but I would I would believe so. I would have to uh, think so. It's because, uh, three in the magazine. Okay, then maybe that was it. I was looking at a different game. I was picking. In any event, when they opened the line on Sunday night, this is, again, after the, the actual line came up at the Westgate, after the uh, New Orleans route of Dallas, they still opened Philadelphia 3, but all the early money uh, up until kickoff on uh, Monday uh, when they took the game off the board was towards New Orleans. So, yes, okay. Philadelphia was still favored, but they were a one-and-a-half point favorite. Okay. okay. Then – uh, Philadelphia plays that game against uh, Atlanta where uh, uh, they must have been coached by a robot or something, but uh, it was some horrible decisions. Anyway, they lose the game. That's the problem. In, 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 a, in of all fashions, on a 48-yard extra point because of the penalty after the Atlanta touchdown. Nonetheless, the line was reposted on a Tuesday morning with the Saints up to two and a half. Uh, and it briefly went up to three before there was a buyback on Philadelphia so that the last time I looked, and I haven't looked this morning yet, was New Orleans two and a half. And I would imagine that they'll probably be floating between two and a half and three uh, up until game time. So I think that I think the line may ultimately come back towards Philadelphia because one of the things I'll take a look at is the overreaction. Is there an overreaction? And I think that perhaps there was a bit too much of an overreaction when they uh, opened the line of uh, um, New Orleans two and a half on Tuesday after the Monday night game. I felt that they were going to make an adjustment for Philadelphia's effort on Monday night. Maybe you open the game, pick them. Maybe you, you open the game one, because at, at that point, they've already gotten a lot of New Orleans money. So maybe they're trying to attract more New Orleans money. Uh, I would have held the, the, the line down a little bit. Okay, so really, is there any, I don't know, is there any advice that you can give anybody? Is it just, hey, if you like the team and you're comfortable with the line the way that it is, then just take it because you don't know if the line's going to go the other way either. I mean, maybe the Eagles win 41 uh, right. nothing, and all of a sudden the line is like three and a half instead of two and a half. Uh, so what would your advice be to somebody that sees a line early in the week or at that, maybe at that specific spot, it could be a Sunday night game or a Monday night game that, that one of those teams is involved. And before there's a chance for the line to move, you know, what do you do? Do you just say to yourself, Hey, if you like the saints and you like the number, just go ahead and do it. Don't worry about the game. Don't worry about the outcome. Just go ahead and take it because chances are you're not going to get much better than that. Or I don't know. You tell me. Well, if you're, if you're betting numbers sometime without regard to the teams, uh, a lot of the early action when these lines are first posted are done by the uh, heavy hitters, the sharp guys, the guys who uh, analyze line movements historically, etc. So if you haven't been part of that group that got involved early or, or reacted to what you saw in the early action, you're probably going to be waiting until you have a better chance to evaluate the games, especially the Monday night game. In other words, why would you necessarily, unless you had a very strong opinion, and even then you might reconsider, if you had a strong opinion on that Monday night game, like let's say you felt the Eagles would lose outright. Well, yeah, then you might say that, you know what, I'll take uh, the points with New Orleans before uh, the Monday night game starts. Or if you thought that uh, uh, that Philadelphia would, would, would win big, then you might say, you know what, I'm going to wait a little bit because, yeah, Philadelphia looked good Monday night. But New Orleans looked really good on Sunday afternoon, so there may still be a lot of sentiment that will drive that line back up towards Philadelphia or uh, might uh, uh, level off a little bit. So it, it's really a question for me, at least. I like to wait until I've seen the most recent contest of the teams I'm considering playing, which normally will be Sunday, Thursday or Sunday. Okay. But in the case of the Monday night game, I probably it would it would I would have to find a really bad number where whatever happens Monday night is not likely to affect me. But then again, you know, suppose you had done that last Thursday for the Miami Buffalo game, and you were going to bet the following week where they have the advanced lines out at the Westgate, for example, and you bet on Miami, and all of a sudden Tua goes out in the middle of the Thursday night game. So now in yeah. Seattle, instead of them being a three point road favorite, they're a five point or four and a half point road underdog. Yeah, that's true. So. Your advice would definitely be then, correct me if I'm wrong, is that if you like a team and you already know what next week's line is and you like the team, you like that, but that team is playing still on Sunday or Monday night, you might want to wait just because the only thing that could possibly go wrong in the game itself could be an injury that's going to work against you. 
Yeah, well, sure. Look, for example, if you had uh, uh, played the uh, 49ers game before the kickoff on Sunday, uh, you would have uh, missed out the uh, the injury news about Debo Samuel now being out. If you had played the Rams game against Arizona before the game, already Ayuk was out, and he's going to be out for, for a few weeks. Now all of a sudden Cooper Cup is out. So, yeah, if, if you're really going to make intelligent wagers, um, you really should be you basing mean, it on Kua out a couple of weeks. Yeah, Kua. Yeah, not okay, at you, but sure. Kua. Yeah, for uh, for the Rams. Yeah, that um, uh, th- that you really want to base it on the most recent after uh, most recent performance. Now there could always be injuries that occur during the week, but those are less yeah, likely sure. than an injury yeah. occurring during actual game action. So yeah, uh, you may end up having to have missed a better number that was available and with lower limits, which. Most most people aren't uh, affected by the uh, by the highest limits. Uh, that uh, you might have passed up an opportunity before the game to bet the following week's games, but you're betting with a little bit more certainty as far as who's going to be playing as opposed to that injury factor. All right, the other game in the NFL I wanted to talk about is a game that definitely can move without a doubt. This is the game that could probably move the most, and that is Green Bay and Tennessee. And the line um, is uh, right now two and a half down from three, a little bit. Uh, And I was actually, I don't know. I was a little bit surprised when I saw it, Um, but I understood uh, only because of the fact that there was still talk as there is today that I don't know, that that, that this seems to be a chance, a a better chance, of course, than last week, but uh, I kind of give it a more 50% chance for what I'm hearing. It love's going to end up playing somehow. Um, so what is your, give me your advice in game situations like this? Well, my analysis on that one is I, I think we may have touched upon it last week that maybe it's a bit of a, uh, of a smoke screen as far as uh, having Tennessee prepare for your least favorite quarterback in the league, Malik <laughs> Willis or yeah. Jordan Love. Now, um, I thought it was extremely unlikely that Love was going to play last week, even though they were floating that out there. And maybe it had a little bit of impact on uh, Indianapolis. Maybe they did spend 25% of their time preparing for a backup quarterback uh, uh, that, uh, or for love rather, uh, despite the fact that he was still more likely than not to, to not to play, but that still meant there was 25 less time to prepare for the quarterback who was going to play. Um, but this week I'm saying that even if love does not play, I might still take a look at green Bay, given the fact that they ran 53 running plays for some huge number of yards last week uh, in the uh, uh, win at Indianapolis. So they were able to compensate for the fact that maybe they don't have much confidence in Willis at all not just given his career, but the fact he's only been with the team just a few weeks, that maybe they were able to design a game plan which seemed to be very effective against Tennessee, uh, ended up uh, uh, um, getting the the uh, Colts. Against Indianapolis last week, yeah, where they got the the win. And maybe they now that they know that they can do that, Tennessee obviously has to prepare not just for whoever's at quarterback, but now they have to prepare for a team that felt comfortable running the ball over 50 times last week. So uh, we may still see, um, you know, I I would like to see from a potential standpoint, I'd like to see them rule love out for next week. And then we'll see this line go down even more. Maybe maybe the game ends up at Pickham or something. And, because of the fact that I've, I've trusted Lafleur as a coach and I've trusted what they did last week was not an aberration, that they will have a game plan similar to what they had last week, emphasize the running so that the passing is kept to an absolute minimum. And Tennessee right now, I still consider one of the weaker teams in the league. Certainly the season win projections consider them probably amongst the bottom six or seven teams. So I would not feel comfortable. I would not feel uncomfortable playing Green Bay uh, even at a, I, I wouldn't mind playing Green Bay right now. But where, where do we have that line? I think it's two and a half. Two and a half. Yeah. And that's uh, that's who's favored there? Yeah, Tennessee. Tennessee. Yeah. So I might uh, wait and see if, um, well, I'd, I mean, if you, you can, can buy can, it to three. I, I'll be, if I play the game, I'm on Green Bay. Oh, absolutely. A matter I was of on fact, Green Bay last week against Indianapolis, even, even with the rumor out there. So, yeah. Well, you might you see if you that, can find a three. Okay. If love is ruled out, you probably will. All right. But, but, but that's, but that's the thing is that if he, if love plays, that's the other advantage. So either way you're in, you're in, you're really in good shape if you like the Packers. 
because yeah, the only the if, only if you advice like him anyway, would... then you better take him now because if Love well, does play, I mean, if Love plays, that line's switching, isn't it? It to does. Two and a half Packers. So it really, yeah, it really, it probably two and a half or three. But see, that depends upon your assessment of how reliable the reports about Love playing are. So you may no, want to monitor that. If he does that. play, if he does play, it's definitely switching. Oh, no, absolutely. That's why I'm saying. You may want to report to see how much of that is really legitimate, or you may just want to go out right now and say, you know what? I'll buy the half point and play Green Bay plus three. And what about if you're a Tennessee backer? What's your situation here? Because that's to me, that's the more difficult one. Because, you know, now you're given points, yet if you sit back and wait and love plays, you're you're getting points. Well, there, Um, yeah, yeah, there again, you're you're trying to make an assessment as to how true you believe those reports are, how likely love is to play. If you think he's going to play, then by all means, wait. If you think, no, he's not going to uh, play, um, then maybe we'll still, we, we saw some late money come in on green Bay last week. Anyway, when it was known or right before game time, we knew that uh, he wasn't going to play. And I think they still got some money on green Bay. So even if love does not play, um, there still may be some Green Bay money, meaning that maybe the line, instead of switching as it would be a fluff plate, maybe the line goes down to Tennessee one or one and a half. All right. Let's talk uh, college now. And what I want to do is uh, we're going to go over the games that we were the most surprised about. And there's one game that both of us were surprised yet in different, for different reasons. Um, an interesting thing is, is that, uh, as far as this game is concerned, I guess maybe I'll find out my answer. I'm going to hold back on, on mine first and I'll, and I'll let you answer sure. it. And then, if, and then I'll know whether or not we're, we're right. We're, it, it matches, but uh, Boston college, Michigan state. So uh, I actually thought it was going to be closer to three, three and a half. You thought it was going to be uh, double digits, 10 and a half. And it winds up being in the middle seven. Yeah. So that, that was kind of good. Me and you could be in a room and we're, we're, we're that, that, that's how the line would have worked out. Uh, we would have met in the middle. So uh, give me your reason. So does that, did that mean you had it there just because that's what you felt or because you actually don't believe enough in Michigan state or believe a lot in Bill O'Brien and the, and the Eagles. Therefore, now that it's seven, you're definitely jumping on BC or was that just a line that was just my opinion about what I thought the line was going to be. And I really had no feeling about one way or another, which way I was going with this game. Well, you sort of touched upon both things. Um, I have great respect for Bill Bryan and I've been very impressed with what Boston college has done so far this year. Um, I, in, in my newsletter uh, before the, it's for the first full week of college action, which would have been the week Labor Day weekend, uh, I usually give out some thoughts on which teams and which conferences in each conference are going to be the money earners it seems to play on throughout the season or you know more on than off and which teams to go against. And BC, as was Georgia Tech, on my list of teams I thought would be profitable uh, over the duration of the season. And so far, they've done fine. Um, uh, on the other hand, Michigan State, I didn't have a – I don't believe I had a solid thought on that. I liked the coaching move, getting Jonathan Smith from Oregon State, but he's coming into the program, doesn't really know the players, and so even though I expect to be a good hire and I expect them to be a decent team, certainly better than last year, it might take some time for sure. uh, Smith to, to, to get things the way he likes them. So I thought that right now – the public is down on Boston is down on Michigan State. They're up on Boston College. Make them pay a little bit of a premium. Uh, okay. It was a, it, my my numbers sort of were on Boston College because my preseason numbers that I started with uh, were were very much down on Michigan State. So I oh, sure. I thought ten I thought ten was a ten 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 and a half was a little bit high, but. Um, I, I, I was thinking from the land of, and again, maybe the, the lines makers don't, don't exactly look this way, but I think they can realize Michigan state's been disappointing. They're not very good. Boston college has been a money maker. Let's make, let's entice people to bet Michigan state, uh, this week, because if we make the number too low, everybody will be on Boston college. Well, the reason that I had the number lower is because I agreed with you when the season began. Everything you said, whether, you know, Jonathan Smith, love him, great hire. Don't think Michigan State's going to amount to much. All of that in the first year. 
But the reason I had it so low is because I've been thoroughly impressed by them this season. They beat Maryland. They've got a young, uh, a, a very young, talented quarterback who's throwing too many interceptions, but at least he's making big plays. They got a hot shot, five star wide receiver making plays. And this is Jonathan Smith. And this guy is just, you know, he's proving so far. Yeah, two games, they didn't play anybody. But the Maryland game was impressive for them to beat Maryland right out of the gate and start 3 and 0. Said, hey, you know what? Jonathan Smith, they're playing well, better than I thought. I'll say three and a half. So that's where I'm coming from, which is why I guess my question then is, is that now that you know the line is seven, are you jumping at this going with Boston College? Or again, like I said, was that just, no, that's just the way I thought the line was going to be. And I really don't have a feeling either way. I actually, when I look at this line right now, if I were to choose your opening number, my opening number, or the actual number, I'd actually feel very strong about the actual number because, it's, as you mentioned, it is in between. Uh, I was on uh, Michigan State getting those generous points at Maryland. I thought the line was way too high. I was not expecting them to win that game. But uh, once again, I look at the coaching matchup, and yep. uh, Jonathan Smith versus Mike Loxley is uh, oh, yeah. generally no contest. Slim so, dunk. You know, yeah. yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Uh, but that not, was but not in this game. Yeah. Yeah, no. Yeah, not in this game because this uh, game. No. we've got uh, <laughs> uh, we've got two good coaches. Yeah, uh, one is uh, just a lot more experienced playing at home, which I think is worth something as well. Uh, so uh, that was that was my thinking in comparing uh, this game sure. to the Michigan State against Maryland. So um, Michigan. But you State don't have a feeling to... for this game now. You're not. You're just going to stay away. No, I I, want... I still would prefer laying the six and a half or seven with Boston College, but there will probably be, I haven't done it yet, but there are probably going to be more games that I'm going to like a little bit better than that. Okay. Fair enough. But, it, but if, right. if forced if forced to make a play one way or the other, it's still Boston College for me. Okay. Now we're going to talk about uh, a couple of games that we actually, uh, th- there were a few games that we uh, flipped uh, and that is Minnesota. You had them as a six point favorite uh, in their matchup. Uh, oh, I, didn't, and, I didn't realize I had them that high, but okay. Yeah. And they're now a two and a half point dog. I don't have to, I'll check and see if that's still the line. And then SMU, you had them as a four point favorite and they're a two and a half point dog. So we can start off with those, those uh, a couple of those games. Uh, and what was the, uh, what was your reasoning? Because uh, for me, uh, with the, well, even if we start with the SMU game, uh, I, I kind of knew the history before I even went into the, research i i, I kind of knew the history of sonny dykes um and kind of give the game that edge and thought that the tcu game against central florida was a really good game and i don't i don't put it against i don't i would i wasn't going to put it in a negative for tcu that they lost that game on the other side smu to me has been one of the most disappointing teams in in college football i mean i don't know what they're doing a quarterback uh uh lashley seems to really like this kid jennings and I, th- and I think this is the thing we talk about a lot in, sp- in football. A coach favors a player when it's a battle, especially a quarterback. And then you understand why. And then I hear why. He's a team captain. He was actually representing SMU at media day as the backup quarterback. So this is how highly Lashley thought of this kid Jennings. Yet Stone was the hot recruit. Even though Jennings had a nice uh, uh, recruiting history as well. But Stone was the hot recruit who had a big season last season for SMU. He didn't end the season, as you know, because of the injury. Jennings won the bowl game. And so there was still a little bit of love there with Jennings. But if you watch the football, especially the game against BYU, and don't forget they had to come from behind in the last minute to escape losing to Nevada in week one. This kid is not played. There's no way this kid is as talented as Stone. Stone is a lot more dangerous quarterback at the stage of their career. Maybe Jennings will turn into a better quarterback, but right now he's not. So I'm a little bit surprised by that. I'm very um, uh, down on the program. So that's why for me it was a lot easier, to, and because we disagreed on this one completely, because you had SMU four, I had TCU seven. Um, but again, we, we kind of met a little bit in the middle. Uh, you had to go a little bit further. So what was the, was it more of you liking SMU or was it more of you just or something about TCU you're just not sold on? Well, it's a non-conference game. And of course, uh, TCU is coming off of that uh, game against Central Florida uh, with, uh, I forget who they have on deck. I don't have the schedule in front of me there, but uh, that's part of this. This rivalry over the last 20 years has 
greatly favored TCU, which means SMU is placing a little bit of a greater emphasis on uh, this game, perhaps, uh, than uh, uh, than TCU is. I like both coaches. I especially like Sonny Dykes. I've liked him throughout his uh, career, and I like the job that he's uh, done at, uh, uh, at T- TCU. Uh, SMU playing at home. Uh, they, they did play well early, but you mentioned the quarterback situation. I don't think there will be reluctance if they fall behind in this game to make well, a quarterback that's change. Yeah. That's that's also part of uh, yep. of the handicap because uh, again, uh, TCU is probably uh, preparing for Jennings based upon what we've seen so far. But I think he's on a short leash this week. I mean, you can only go you can only go with, go with him so long before you realize, hey, your season's getting out of control uh, if you don't make the change. So that was uh, that one with the Minnesota game. Uh, I was surprised. I, I, I don't know if I had a typo on the six, but I, I would have thought they still would have been favored but by about three. It's been a very competitive okay. series the last couple of years. It was a three point. I think um, I think Minnesota won at Iowa by three last year or no, by two last year. And Iowa won at Minnesota by three the year before. So uh, this is a game that uh, I'll be looking. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll, the, uh, I'll, I'll double total. check. I mean, yeah, I'll double but, check uh, to make sure it wasn't a typo. But either way, you had Minnesota as a favorite. Yes, that is correct. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I had them as a favorite playing at home against an, uh, an Iowa team that continues to have problems uh, sustaining an, an offense. And that works nicely for Minnesota, who likes to uh, control the clock as well. And I just think Minnesota has better athletes on the offensive side of the football. Iowa's been pretty solid defensively, but Minnesota's had a pretty good defense the last couple of years as well. So it's largely based upon the fact that that I thought Minnesota, I, talent-wise, I think overall offense and defense, the game is probably dead even, which is basically what the scores the last two years reflect, although it, the interesting part is the road team won both of those games. But uh, when I take a look at which team is likely to feel more comfortable playing the other team style, I think Minnesota is more comfortable playing uh, Iowa style than, than vice versa. All right. And then uh, the one I, I wanted to talk about that I was way off on uh, from a flip kind of deal was Virginia. And he, the thing was, was that I knew when I was thinking about this, I was like, you know what? Uh, I know it's ACC versus uh, Sun Belt and all that. You know, the Sun Belt, we know how much better they've gotten, but still it's ACC. Virginia is an improving team. Yeah, they had a, a bad week, but um, I don't know. It's on the road. Coastal's off to a great start. I just can't. There's something about me favoring Virginia on the road against a good team I just can't do. And then I ended up looking at the uh, the trends, care of, of course, Playbook uh, Magazine, and found out that this was probably the thing that was bugging me. I didn't know specifically what it was, but this was probably what, what was bugging me about uh, why I just didn't feel comfortable taking Virginia in this role. And that is because... They have not been a road favorite since 2019. So that's a lot for a young team, as we all know, that uh, is trying to rebuild. It's a rebuilding program going on with Tony Elliott that if they haven't been in this spot in a long time, uh, that's a lot of pressure to put on them, especially against a good Coastal Carolina home team. So, yeah, so that's the reason why uh, I had flipped. Uh, What did you did you kind of feel that that was just about what you thought it was going to be? Uh, I forget what I put. Uh, I think I had Coastal Carolina favorite, if I remember you correctly. Did. I don't, okay. I don't remember. It may have been six or seven. Um, oh, really? I, I I don't remember what the what the number was because okay. I don't think I put it in in my list. But I know I had them favored. Um, Virginia. Uh, I think they they had didn't they, that was a back and forth game that they won the week before against Wake Forest, and actually in the game against Maryland. Um, I think Maryland opened the favorite and went off the underdog. And of course, I think, uh, didn't Maryland win that game? If I remember yep. uh, last yeah, Virginia weekend, had, yeah. uh, the quarterback had, had an awful game. They had a ton yeah. of turnovers. Yeah, it was ugly. But more importantly, I like this Coastal Carolina team. They've been a solid program for the last several years. Yep. And I took, actually, I think I found a three and a half on Coastal Carolina the other day. And I uh, also made a little bit of a money line play on Coastal on this one. Okay. Because I think it's the, uh, it's uh, again ACC going into Sun Belt country games more important for a Sun Belt uh, team. I mean, I want to see. That's we had, we saw that last week. We saw, for example, UNLV going into Kansas, chance to beat a, a, a their second team this year from a Power Four conference, yeah. and they yes. did that. Well, Coastal Carolina doesn't get many opportunities to do that, so I think that's an important game for them, and um, that that's why I that's why I'm on Coastal Carolina this week. All right, and now let's wrap up. 
Uh, one more I forgot to uh, throw in here in the NFL. I wanted to just get was the Indianapolis uh, line. We both had uh, Indianapolis around a three point favorite. You had three, I had three and a half, and it ended up only being one against Chicago. So the question here I have is, especially because Caleb Williams has not looked all that great as a rookie. Uh, he, he, they're, they're actually pretty lucky that they actually have a win. Uh, otherwise, you know, they'd be 0-2. And, and then maybe the line would be a little bit different. But right now the line is one and a half Indianapolis. So the, I guess the question is, is should the Bears be getting this much respect? And uh, do you know why Vegas seems to be liking them so far this season, I guess, because this would be a, hey, they're on the road. They're both, they're, you know, I know Indianapolis hasn't won yet, but they almost beat Houston at home a couple of weeks ago. I don't know. You tell me. Well, and that may be part of it, that looking at that effort against Indianapolis, against Houston, Indianapolis played well in that game. And uh, despite having the advantage, remember, they, uh, uh, they, their defense played better than expected, even though Green Bay was able to uh, run for a lot of yards. It took a lot of attempts for them to uh, to do that last week as well, even though I think it was six or seven yards per carry. I think there were a couple of big plays in there. Oh, they killed them think, early. And then, yeah, and then, uh, yeah, and then everything then changed. Yeah. Colts made a little bit of an adjustment there. And it was, yeah. it was a 16 to 10 game. I believe they, that was the final score. But I think it's just general disappointment uh, in the uh, Chicago Bears. So maybe what they're saying is we don't know when Chicago is going to start playing, but we're going to make you pay for it by giving you only one point this week instead of uh, the two or three that perhaps we would have thought. So not quite sure what to make out of it. Uh, I'd have to say that over because Chicago, look, they didn't play a terrible game against the Texans, certainly not no. defensively, but uh, the offense leaves a lot to be desired. And you would you would have liked to have seen some improvement from Caleb Williams from week one to week two. And I'm not saying that uh, we didn't see improvement, but maybe yeah. it's more a case of he was not as bad in week two that he was as he was in week one. So you don't think this is uh, again because we both had the Colts as three and it ended up one. So you don't think that this is anything where Vegas is uh, just again. You don't think that they seem to be favoring Chicago for any reason. Well, they are because if you take a look, our numbers of, of basically three, three and a half say that on a neutral field, the Colts and the Bears are are even or pick them. And I don't know that that's quite. I think right now you still have to say Indianapolis is the better team, but the lines yeah, maker is yeah. going the other way and saying that if this were on a neutral field, uh, the Bears might be uh, uh, you know, a two- to three-point favorite, and I, I just can't see that yet. I think the Bears okay. are going to be a team that shows progress throughout the season. And if this game were being played in November instead of in September, maybe at that point the Bears would come a field goal favorite, uh, although probably it would be no worse than pick them here. But based upon the Indianapolis minus one, Bears might have been a road favorite if they're playing in November on this field. Andy, appreciate it. You and I, uh, we both have to run. We are recording on the Playbook Experts YouTube channel. Uh, again, you can check that out. Uh, we have that uh, weekly handicapping show uh, with the legends of handicapping, including Mark Lawrence, Jim Feist, and, and others. Uh, so uh, we're going to be doing that. Check that out every Wednesday night or Thursday morning. The show is posted and available on demand on Playbook Experts. Uh, I will be with Mark Lawrence tomorrow right here on the RLS Football Network to preview the weekend, the NFL and college football. So don't forget to stay tuned for that. And Andy, uh, again, uh, the logical uh, You want to go ahead and just uh, give a quick plug. Yeah, just visit the website. We'll be starting to putting up our weekly football uh, statistical spreadsheet after uh, this coming week's games. I usually like to wait to do that until the NFL, each team has played at least one home game and one road game. Uh, it's just uh, it's less stress on the computer system, but also makes a little bit more sense to give you at least some form of comparison of how teams have done early in the season. For example, uh, the Cleveland Browns were the worst team on the road last year in the NFL defensively, or amongst the worst, and they were the best team at home this year. Well, their first two games, they played very well in Jacksonville, <laughs> and they played very poorly at home against Dallas. Yeah. So you may want year to check to that out. And as I say, starting next week, yeah, year, week to week almost. Yes, yeah. well. well. All right, Andy. Uh, we'll, we'll be back again next week for more here on Predict the Lines. And let us know questions, comments, uh, any tips, anything like that that you want us to talk about uh, that we haven't yet. Uh, let us know, and we'll definitely get back to you. So uh, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you.